welcome. This is Afshin Ratatsi and Yvonne Ridley joining you from the heart of London as we set sail with a brand new passenger list. Yes, climbing on board our showboat today are a host of folk who could be described as people of the book. Most of them are authors. One of our guests throws the book at the International Criminal Court, which he reckons is not delivering justice to those who need it, while another has written extensively about what he thinks is the real terrorist threat in Britain. But the contents are so hot, it's top secret. So secret, no one can read it for at least three years. And I bet some wish they could classify and ban the works of another guest, which blows the lid off Zionism. In fact, he reckons the real inheritors of Palestine are the Arabs whose families lived there for centuries before Islam, and he's Jewish. This and much, much more coming up, so do not adjust your set. We're about to set sail on board the only floating studio in the world. Well, we've got a really packed programme today, and our first guest is an international lawyer and the son of a Holocaust survivor. He has worked in The Hague, the Balkans and Africa, as well as the United Nations and the World Bank. He's also advised several American presidential candidates, and he advised the legal advisor to the U.S. State Department. Right now, he's an associate at a Washington, D.C.-based international law firm. In his book, After Genocide, Bringing the Devil to Justice, he exposes the shortcomings of the international justice system. Adam Smith, welcome to uh, HMS President. It's difficult to know where to begin, but uh, let's say uh, Sudan. Uh, President Bashir uh, goes to important conferences. What, what is the point of the International Criminal Court when so many people disagree with their decisions even before a trial starts? And, and is it just a waste of money? Well, I'm not sure about, th about that. I mean, the indictment of Bashir I find very questionable and, and upsetting. Not so much that he's being indicted, because I think the gentleman deserves what he gets. Uh, it's more along the lines of what the costs of that indictment have been, and not just financial costs, mind you. Uh, when he was indicted, of course, he threatened to, and then he did, through all the aid agencies out of Darfur, uh, imperiling hundreds of thousands of people, which I think... Although we don't know if that's true. I have to say, I've, I've written about the uh, odd uh, situation in Darfur versus the international media. I know that you uh, you met uh, President Bashir quite recently. Yes, and, and I went down to Darfur. Of course, there was a... a um, the Sudanese government would deny that uh, there was any hardship to anyone when those uh, agencies were expelled. But uh, what the uh, writ served to do was create um, a, a real sort of aura around the president, made him more popular than ever. And if there's an election tomorrow, it'll be a cakewalk for him. The people absolutely adore him. They, they really rallied round and took this ICC thing as something very personal. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, and, and it, you saw that also in the Balkans when Milosevic was indicted. I mean, it, it basically made someone like Milosevic, who was not very popular at the time, he was lionized when he was taken to The Hague. And I think the same thing is going to happen here. And for me, that's one of the big problems of the ICC, is that it's all fine and good if they were to take Bashir and bring him to The Hague and, and try him. But for me, that's not the issue. The issue are the tens of thousands hundreds of thousands perhaps of Sudanese young people that support him and lionize him and perhaps even support what has happened in Darfur. That's, that's the bigger problem. And my concern about inter international justice is that it doesn't actually solve that problem. In other words, the idea of getting, never, getting to never again, you sort of don't move there because the people who are going to be in charge of the never again, the next generation, are actually on the wrong side of the fence partly because of the indictment. The other thing is Sudan, like Israel, refuses to recognize the ICC. So how do you enforce it? Well, and enforcing it is not perhaps that difficult because all you'd need to do is have someone either go into Sudan and, and extract him or when he travels somewhere else to a member state, uh, they are under some obligation to do so. Thanks very, very much no. for that, Adam. That's uh, you, fascinating Adam. stuff there. Well, if uh, you thought that book caused a few waves about the International Criminal Court, our next guest really rocked the boat when he dropped uh, by uh, this boat in, uh, uh, just a few days ago. Have a look. Our next guest has written this book, which is really rocking the boat from Tel Aviv to London. Welcome to Professor Shlomo Sand. Thank you. 
The invention of the Jewish people, it brings into question the whole origins of those living in Israel today, surely. Yeah, this is the reason that they are shocked with the book, even if it become a bestseller in Tel Aviv. Yeah, I put questions about the origins and also the development, the history of the Jew. I don't believe that it was a Jewish people. I think it was only, only a Jewish religion, a very important religion, but not people in the modern sense of the word people. You call the, you call the creation of Israel rape, or you liken, liken it mm -hmm. to rape, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, you say that there was no exile of Jewish people. Yeah, this is the reason that I'm not using the word return to Palestine, you see, like the Zionists uh, use it. Uh, rape, because you mentioned rape, then I have to complete. I, I use the, the word rape about the creation of the Israeli state to explain that even a son of a rape has the right to live. You see, in some way, putting on question the Jewish people, the, all the Jewish myths, all the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, legitimation to conquer Palestine, I don't put the question the existence of the Israeli well, state the today. The Jewish exile is something that has been talked about uh, for centuries. As it doesn't mean that it's fact. true, you know. Uh, I, I believe that the French, a uh, long time ago, you know, uh, were sure that they are the descendant of the Gauls. And just, and just, before, I, just before I let one back in here, uh, because I was in Tehran or by the Alborz Mountains for last year, you do mention uh, monotheism in uh, Persia and the connection there with Judaism. Uh, again, do, have people written much about that? Because no, that there, that there is, is a little bit, uh, but not, uh, you know, not famous and not for the large public. There is, you know, I put the, the hypothesis that uh, the Jewish monotheism started much later than people believe because of the Bible. It started, I think, more or less in the fifth century before uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, and it was, uh, it, it take birth because of, uh, you know, exiled people from, Pal uh, from Judea to Persia, you know, in meeting the, the Persian religion that make birth uh, the Jewish religion. The word religion in Hebrew, it's that, and it has a Persian origins. Around the time of Persepolis. Did you have difficulty getting a publisher for this book? No, no. Uh, I stress in the end of the book that we are not a really democratic state, but we are in some way a liberal state. I mean, there is a kind of pluralism, political, ideo ideological pluralism in Israel, uh, not uh, during the wars. But uh, usually I can publish, I can teach. For the moment, uh, it's okay. 